Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Grey Refuel, where I recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today's the 17th of September, 2021. Alright everyone, let's get into it. So before I get into the news from the last 24 hours, I did want to give a quick reminder that there will be an AMA happening in the Daily Grey Discord channel tomorrow. Same kind of format as usual if you're used to kind of attending those, and if you can't attend, of course, it'll be recorded and put on YouTube uh, on Sunday. Um, if you have any questions for me and you can't make it, be sure to drop them in the AMA series channel on discord uh um the times for it are basically early morning uh, us kind of like afternoon in europe and asia it's kind of like evening and australia is like 11 p.m <laughs> for me anyway um so yeah if you if you if you can make it cool if you can't it's all good uh, i'll be sure to answer your question and then um, you'll be able to uh watch it on the recap uh the, the recording sorry on youtube so yeah but anyway into the news from the last 24 hours so there was a a, a kind of like i guess piece posted in The Economist, which is kind of like a famous, uh, I, I guess, like a magazine turned, I guess, like digital publisher here, where they discuss DeFi. So you can see here on the front page, they've got down the, the rabbit hole, the promise and perils of decentralized finance. And they've got like a, a, obviously a nice illustration of a rabbit hole here with Ethereum, Bitcoin, dollars, whatever back here. But there was a quote that Justin LaRue kind of, um, I guess, extracted from this piece here where, where it reads, and I quote, Bitcoin, the first big blockchain created in 2009, is now a distraction. Instead, Ethereum, a blockchain network created in 2015, upon which most DeFi applications are built, is reaching critical mass. This uh, Bitcoin is now a distraction really caught me off guard here a little bit because I was like, I never thought of it that way, that Bitcoin was a distraction. Now, you guys know me. I'm not exactly bullish on Bitcoin. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say I don't expect the price to go up over time, of course, but I would say that just the ecosystem, I'm not very bullish on. But at the same time, I never thought about it as like a distraction because really, I don't really think about Bitcoin very often. I don't pay attention to it or anything like that. But I actually think it is a distraction for a lot of people who come into this industry, not necessarily individuals, but more like institutions that come into this industry, they look at Bitcoin and they kind of like spend so much time on it. And meanwhile, they're missing the the real revolution happening within this industry, which is Ethereum, um, you know, Web3, all that sort of stuff, DeFi, NFTs, and all, all that sort of stuff happening there. Uh, and they kind of like just fall further behind. So, and you know, there's there's lots of people entering this ecosystem, not through Bitcoin anymore, just through Ethereum and other crypto networks, and that's fine. But I think these institutions, because they're, they're so large and because they're so risk averse, they definitely start with Bitcoin first. But I really think that that's actually a, a negative for them to be doing that at this stage, because they're, they're definitely going to move from Bitcoin to Ethereum, uh, you know, relatively quickly. But the longer they wait to do that move and the longer they spend kind of like grappling with Bitcoin, maybe they spend a few months kind of like grappling with Bitcoin, trying to understand it, trying to understand the risk profile, talking to people about it, um, getting educated on it, you know, educating their clients about it, all that sort of stuff. That takes a few months at least. And then uh, from there, they kind of like say, okay, well, what's after Bitcoin? And, you know, they may have purchased some BTC or whatever. And they may have their clients uh, bought into BTC. Then they're uh, like, okay, well, let's start with Ethereum. And Ethereum is obviously a much deeper rabbit hole than uh, than Bitcoin is. And it probably takes even more than a few months to get uh, themselves and their clients up to speed on what Ethereum is. So it could be a full year from when these institutions start looking into crypto to when they actually allocate to ETH or they actually start making um, investments in Ethereum-based kind of like projects and infrastructure and stuff like that. So it, it's it's really, I mean, this, this kind of like, like, quote, Bitcoin is now a distraction, really uh, rang true with me when I read this, uh, when I read this, sorry. Um, and that wasn't the only thing that was in this kind of like piece here. You can go to the website, the, the Economist website. I can't remember if it's paywalled or not. Um, I think it is paywalled. Yes, unfortunately, but you can go read this uh, if you want to. I'm sure someone will link the unpaywalled version in the Discord channel if you ask about that as well. Um, but from from everything that I saw from people who had read it, they seemed to, to like the piece as well. But yeah, I mean, the thing that caught me off a little bit off guard was that this quote, um, and you know, not just because, see, it, it's funny because like I say, I'm not trying to insult Bitcoin by saying it's a distraction. I'm just trying to kind of illustrate the point that Bitcoin is just so limited in what you can kind of do with it and learn and learn about. I mean, really, when people are learning about Bitcoin, they're just learning about the fundamentals of blockchain, right? And how, how a blockchain works and how crypto networks work and how, you know, how, it, how, a, how an asset can be scarce when it's digital, how it can't be copy pasted, all that sort of stuff. That kind of stuff you can learn while learning Ethereum. So if you're going to move into Ethereum anyway, then there should be some foresight here where you're basically like, okay, well, you know, whatever, um, I, I'm not interested in Bitcoin, I'm going to go look at Ethereum because that's where all the, where all the action is. 
like I, I just don't see anything happening with with Bitcoin. And and you know what? The funny thing is, like at the moment, people are saying, "Oh, a Bitcoin ETF is going to be um, approved in October," which you know may or may not. There's a lot of people saying that it will, but who knows? They're just trying to jump up a narrative, probably. And you know, maybe the price rises in anticipation of an event that doesn't actually eventuate. But the point is, is that there's nothing happening in Bitcoin. Like there's really nothing going on there. I would be bored out of my mind if all I was doing was Bitcoin stuff. And yes, okay, you have things like the El Salvador stuff and 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 the Lightning Network and, and things like that going on there. But it's just, it's tiny, absolutely tiny in comparison to what's happening with Ethereum. And, and generally, you can kind of get up to speed really, really quickly with that sort of stuff. There's no... You know, as far as I know, there's no like daily Bitcoin show that talks about the all the Bitcoin developments happening. It's usually talking about the price or talking about the macro environment or talking about like tangential things that aren't exactly got to do with Bitcoin, which is fine. And people like Bitcoin for different reasons. As I said, I'm not trying to like crap all over Bitcoin here. But if you are going to eventually just end up spending all your time in the Ethereum ecosystem anyway, then going through Bitcoin is not a necessary step anymore. It hasn't been for quite a while. And it's actually detrimental to do that uh, because it sets you back and it, and it kind of like put you more even more behind than you may be just coming into this ecosystem. So yeah, just wanted to give a bit of color around that. Um, and yeah, if you get, if you want to read this piece, you can go read it. As I said, it's paywalled, but I think there's various different ways to get around paywalls, uh, but I'm not aware of them. Anyway, moving on. Uh, so I wrote a newsletter today about this stat, but I was looking at um, Glassnode last night um, for, I guess, like uh, various different metrics. Um, and I, I kind of like uh, went to my one of my favorite metrics, Ethereum HODL waves. Now, what this metric shows is it shows kind of like at each period of time, how long has, um, you know, uh, some, some amount of ETH not moved on chain. And you can see here, I put on my tweet, 87% of ETH supply hasn't moved on chain for three months or longer. And uh, if you actually, like, I, I kind of like removed the one to three month metric. I mean, you can see on the top of the chart here, there's there's one week to one month, one day to one month and 24 hours. I, I removed those and just showed um, ETH that hadn't moved on chain for three months or longer. And it's quite a lot. Obviously, you can see that there's been no ETH that hasn't moved uh, um, over seven years because the Ethereum network hasn't been live for that much. And you can kind of see how, how it comes into view once the Ethereum network ages to that point with like the five to seven year which is kind of like that turquoise color you can see that it came into view there and it's actually amazing there's you know just eyeballing it here there seems to be like five percent or six percent of the supply hasn't moved in five to seven years on chain what like that's that's insane right five percent of the supply is millions of eth um so you know i'm, I'm just kind of like thinking about that i'm like okay well, how does that eventuate is it because people have lost their private key uh is it because um they just uh are in like deep cold storage they don't want to touch it at all they've probably just like got multiple wallets where those wallets are like their hodl forever kind of thing um whereas they have their kind of like stash that they've cashed out and you may be wondering oh maybe they just want to stake and well i mean that would have shown if they staked because uh, when you stake, you have to move your ETH on chain into the deposit contract. So it would have shown up here. I'm sure some people did that, but this is literally ETH that hasn't moved in five years or more on chain, which means it hasn't moved since 2016, since ETH was like $10 or less and in, in 2016. So uh, that's amazing, right? I mean, like that's a, they're sitting on a 300X gain or over a 300X gain right now, and they haven't moved their, their ETH to cash it out to do anything with it. So as I said, like either these private keys are, are lost because some of them would be lost because um, if they haven't claimed it from the ICO, I'm sure that they were either lost or, you know, just inaccessible for whatever reason. Um, but generally what I wanted to focus on actually with this metric, and this is what I wrote the newsletter about today, is that it's very nuanced. Because just because this has, uh, ETH hasn't moved on chain doesn't mean it hasn't changed hands. Now, what I mean by this is on centralized exchanges, they have cold storage, obviously. There's about 13% of ETH on centralized exchanges right now. Um, and, that, and while that ETH is in cold storage, it may sit there for quite a while because really the exchange only needs to re re get it out of cold storage if they need to replenish their hot wallet reserves um, or they need to kind of like reshuffle for security reasons. Some exchanges do this sometimes. Uh, Coinbase did a big one a couple of years ago. Um, but other than that, they don't have to move the ETH because when you're trading on a centralized exchange, you are not trading like you are on a, on a, on a DEX where on a Uniswap, for example, there is an on-chain transaction that happens and and um, ETH changes hands that way. Say like someone's bought ETH for USDC, we have that on-chain transaction that happens, whether it's on layer one or layer two, it doesn't matter. 
But on a centralized exchange, it is just all a database, like a, a SQL database or whatever, where it's just an IOU system where no unchained transactions actually happen until a user withdraws ETH or deposits ETH into the exchange. So all the trading you won't see on chain because that's just not how they work. And you know, there's other kind of like uh, uh, things like this, like DYDX that, that works similarly, except it is a decentralized exchange and it is on layer two, but it works similarly where it has like an off-chain kind of like order book, an off-chain order matching system where where it will only process the on-chain stuff when you withdraw or deposit into, into the exchange. So that model there is obviously very scalable. I mean, as we've seen, it's not very scalable to have a decentralized exchange on, on layer one. It kind of hits a, hits a limit eventually. But that kind of illustrates the point that just because this ETH may not have moved off an exchange or may have not moved on, on chain from an exchange uh, doesn't mean it hasn't changed hands. And that's why I think some people can kind of like attribute this and say, oh, wow, you know, 87% hasn't moved in three months or more. That means everyone's holding. Well, no, no it doesn't mean that. And even on top of that, if you kind of like look at the ETH, say, locked in DeFi, for example, there's plenty of ETH locked in DeFi right now in Maker and Arva that's acting as collateral that may sit as collateral for three or more months, for example. Like personally, the ETH that I've used to borrow against has definitely sat in Maker for, for longer than three months at this point. Um, so that would be considered, you know, ETH that that is just uh, uh, sitting there. But, you know, I could at any time pay my loan, down, uh, lo uh, loan back, right? withdraw that ETH and just sell it straight away. So it's kind of like nuanced when you look at that. And then maybe it could be liquidated. I mean, I don't think I'm going to be liquidated. My liquidation price is pretty low, but you know, people do get liquidated on these sorts of things uh, quite commonly, depending, especially if the market moves sharply down. Um, and then on top of that as well, you have things where this metric actually makes a lot of sense for. And that's something like the deposit contract, because the deposit contract is where everyone has to send their ETH to in order to stake on ETH2. And there's about 7.7 .7 million ETH in there right now. Not all of it has been in there for three months or more, but the majority has because it growth slowed down a lot, um, obviously. But the reason why I say that this counts like and, and is and, and is kind of like something that's actually a lot of signal here is because that is provably locked that can't be moved from that deposit contract until withdrawals are enabled sometime next year. It's looking like maybe mid next year is when this happens, maybe even later than that. So that's provably locked in there, cannot be moved, cannot be sold, nothing can be done with it. Even if you stop staking or you get slashed and you get ejected from the validator set while on ETH2, you can't withdraw that ETH. It's stuck there until withdrawals are, are enabled. So we can safely say that there is at least 7.7 .7 million ETH that has been completely taken out of the circulation until a certain date. And then you have a bunch of other things like, as I said, I think anything older than five years that hasn't moved on chain is a pretty low chance that that's not going to move. Uh, if it hasn't moved by now, considering the 300x gain that pe these people would be sitting on, I doubt it's going to move anytime soon. Then you have all the provably lost ETH, uh, like the um, parity multisig uh, kind of um, exploit that happened where there's hundreds of thousands of ETH stuck in there. And then, um, you know, there's a bunch of other kind of like little things, uh, little bibs and bops uh, here and there. So yeah, that's why I say like when you look at kind of metrics like this, and this is what I actually go on about in the data pump videos that I do, um, I say that you have to look at the nuance behind it because you can't just take it at face value because, I mean, there are some people doing kind of like psyops on chain where they're trying to trick people with these metrics. But at the end of the day, um, I don't think that's a huge part of it. But it, it just generally, um, there's a lot more nuance to these things than meets the eye. And, you know, I think it's funny, especially when I see people say, oh, look at all the ETH going out of centralized exchanges. You know, it must be going into cold storage. No, it could be going into staking. It could be going into DeFi. It could be going into uh, cold storage, of course. It could be going to, to buy NFTs or whatever. It's very different. Uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm glad that ETH is getting off centralized exchanges, obviously, because I, I want um, centralized exchanges to, to lose their power and lose their dominance over the Ethereum network. But uh, at the same time, it doesn't mean it's going into cold storage. So again, there's just nuance, a lot of nuance here with these kinds of metrics. But if you want to read a bit more about this, it's in the newsletter. But I'm going to move on from that for now. So an update on that OpenSea insider trading, uh, Devin Finza, the CEO of OpenSea, kind of put out a, a, just a short update here saying that they requested Nate's, uh, the, the head of product at OpenSea, the one that did this insider trading, they requested his uh, uh, resignation and obviously they accepted it. Uh, and he's kind of like, hasn't given his own statement yet on this or anything like that. So we'll keep an eye out for that. Maybe he won't, who knows. Um, one thing I did want to discuss is that I found it a little bit weird 
on Twitter today where I saw people being like, you know, they forgive Nate, you know, people, uh, it, it's kind of like uh, people, everyone makes mistakes, blah, blah, blah. And fair enough. It, people make mistakes and like you can forgive people, whatever. Depending on your sense of justice, you may forgive people sooner rather than later. But what I found weird and, and kind of like really puzzles me is that it's not like he made an accident. Like, it's not like it was an accident, right? It was not like it was something that was uh, was not premeditated. He knew what he was doing. He knew that what he was doing was wrong. Um, and if he didn't, he was incredibly naive. But I guess that's why we have courts to prove that or not. But generally, I don't know. I just felt it really weird. And, you know, I don't know the guy at all. I don't know Nate. I never I never met him, never talked to him. And from what I've heard, he was a great guy. He, he did really great stuff at OpenSea around, around the product and everything like that. So I'm not trying to attack his character or anything like that. This isn't really even about him. It's just more about generally people in this industry having really low standards, I guess. And it kind of like sometimes annoys me uh, with these sorts of things. But I'm not saying that people shouldn't be forgiven for their mistakes. And if you kind of like try to make amends, maybe he pays back the money or donates all the money he made to charity or something like that. That's fine. Um, and people can learn and, and, and be better in the future. But just from where I'm kind of like sitting, it just feels really weird to kind of say that this was like a mistake. Uh, this was kind of like a, I don't know. People, I, I know um, saying something was a mistake doesn't imply that it was something that happened on accident. But from what I'm reading, it feels like people are saying, well, the, you know, it will be, or implying that he did this on accident or he did this without knowing the consequences or whatever, which I don't believe to be true. But anyway, I don't want to kind of like moralize too much about this sort of stuff. I I, I definitely um uh, uh, I kind of like sympathize with the fact that people shouldn't be like attacking this person constantly. Obviously, he's he's already kind of like screwed up a lot and he's lost his job has probably lost tens of millions of dollars worth of equity in OpenSea. That is the most insane thing to me. The fact that he would risk, you know, uh, risk that and has basically lost that now. I mean, that's got to hurt, right? I mean, and at the end of the day, from what I saw, he only made 19 ETH from this insider trading as well, which I mean, yes, okay, it may be a lot of money to some people, but 19 ETH compared to tens of millions of dollars from the OpenSea equity he probably owned, um, very bizarre to me. But anyway, I'm not going to moralize there. Maybe you guys have different thoughts. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments at the end of the day. Everyone, everyone has a different way of viewing these things, but I'm going to move on from that for today. So... Um, some drama around SushiSwap over the last 24 hours. There was two things um, around SushiSwap. I haven't got the link to the other thing here, but there was an exploit that happened on their kind of like NFT, I guess, um, sale that they were doing. Uh, I think like $2.8 million was stolen worth of ETH was stolen about 800 and something ETH. I, uh, I just saw 100 ETH was returned just before. Um, but the exploit, uh, as far as I know, was not done at kind of like the smart contract level. It was done at the front end level where the person that they had hired, I think it was a contractor to do the front end work, basically put an exploit in there that was able to steal these funds. And now some of it's being returned. So obviously, the person is kind of like, well, I, you know, I better return the funds here because I think people did some on-chain sleuthing and found out that his uh, dress was tied to some KYC exchanges. So yeah, that's always a really new mistake. Um, and then the second piece, uh, I guess not drama, but the second piece of news out of Sushi Swap, Sushi Swap today was that the project lead Zero X Maki or Maki uh, is stepping down. So he's dropped down to an advisor role. And for those who don't know who Maki is, he is basically the reason why Sushi Swap is still alive today. So just a bit of context here. When Sushi Swap ended up, uh, uh, sorry, when Sushi Swap launched late last year, when it did its like vampire attack against Uniswap, there was a lot of drama surrounding it. And then, and then the, at the end of it, like we, I think a week after it launched, the original creator Chef Nomi ended up stealing uh, a lot of the the sushi or kind of like uh, that was uh, in the dev fund. And then he returned it later. And then there was kind of like a leadership void within within Sushi Swap. And Maki, who was already a contributor to it, basically stepped up to the plate and um, kept working on Sushi Swap during the kind of like DeFi bear that followed DeFi Summer and and made it into a powerhouse. So essentially it, it went from just being a decentralized exchange um, to a kind of like universe of solutions. So, you know, that was pretty cool to see that happen. Like I was originally very, very critical of SushiSwap because I thought the way that the whole thing was handled was pretty gross. I, I thought the vampire attack was was pretty gross. Um, and I just thought that uh, it was it was it was kind of shitty at, at, the, at the time. But then I grew, I grew to have a lot of respect for Maki. Um, I grew to kind of like respect the fact that they were actually trying to build something different than just being a fork. And I kind of like embraced it. I mean, I never really bought sushi. I think I bought some uh, for a short period of time and then sold it. I never
never really uh, kind of like held it for very long. But that was that had nothing to do with me kind of like my outlook on the project. Sorry, uh, and I still think the project um, um, should be fine going forward. But this is a big blow for sure, and I'm curious to to know why he left. There hasn't been a personal statement given by him yet. I'm sure there will be, um, uh, maybe by my by, by next week. But uh, yeah, I mean, dropping to an advisor role, leaving to, to maybe do something else. But I mean, he was the heart and soul of Sushi. He's going to be hard to replace. But there are a lot of good people working there. They've got a they've got a decent sized team, so I'm sure they'll be fine. But yeah, it was kind of like a bit of a bit bit of shocking news, I guess, over the last 24 hours out of out of Sushi Swap here. So EnterDAO has published their white paper. So I haven't had a chance to read this yet because I just saw it before I started recording the refuel. But essentially, you can go kind of like read uh, this Medium post here. It'll give you a rundown of exactly what EnterDAO is, what they're trying to do, uh, kind of how the Enter token kind of uh, plays into it and everything like that. So, uh, I mean, how, what they're going to be doing with yield farming, liquidity pools, uh, they're kind of like team and everything like that. So, yeah, definitely go uh, check out this if you want to learn more about EnterDAO. I remember I, I brought this up, I think, last week on the refuel when they announced kind of like their initial raise and kind of came out of stealth here, uh, and they describe themselves as a decentralized organization on Ethereum, uh, founded with the mission to build products enabling new markets within the metaverse economy. So definitely a metaverse NFT play here. If you're interested in what they're doing, definitely check out the white paper. So uh, Layer 2 continues its growth. $3.6 billion is now locked in Layer 2s on Ethereum with Arbitrum still leading the charge. But DYDX and Optimism have seen some great growth recently as well. Uh, DYDX is growing really, really fast from what I've seen. I think it's because they now have the token, uh, the token now has a price and they have like liquidity mining or a form of liquidity mining on their exchange. So people are kind of, uh, I guess, like uh, wanting to get the rewards there. But I mean, I've been using DYDX more recently and it's a really nice exchange. Like seriously, uh, I mean, it's the, the, the thing I love most about it is the fact that I can trade on there you know, on a decentralized exchange without having to sign every transaction, uh, which means I don't incur gas fees or anything like that because the way DYDX works is that it basically um, has, as I mentioned before, the off-chain kind of like order book where it's doing all these off-chain matching and it's kind of like an IOU system until you withdraw uh, funds from the exchange. So that's really cool to, to see growing. But I mean, Arbitrum's growth is, is, is being, uh, I mean, incredible to see. And I'm sure Optimism is coming out uh, with their major announcement probably today. Pro you know what's funny? I'm probably going to uh, see this when I finish recording the refuel. Remember last week they teased that they were going to have a major announcement this week. Uh, maybe it comes out today. Maybe it comes out next week. I don't know there. But generally, Layer 2s, I mean, as I said here, just getting started. It's so early in the Layer 2 space. People make fun of me sometimes saying, oh, you're always saying it's early. I'm like, it's because it is early. Come on, guys. Like, it's, it. you know, when you look at the 3.6 billion here and then you just look at what's locked in Ethereum DeFi alone, it's like 100 billion. We're only 3.6% of the way to being on, on par with what's locked in Ethereum DeFi. And then you can count some of the other chains as well in their DeFi ecosystems. And then you can just say, well, that's still very small. So we're growing to trillion, we're going to be at trillions of dollars locked, um, you know, sooner than than people think, I believe. But yes, really, really cool to see, see the growth playing out there. And I mean, layer twos aren't the only thing that's growing. Polygon's POS chain is continuing to uh, uh, grow. It has consistent growth here. You can see my Hilo from Polygon basically put out a TLDR saying that there's been a new all-time high for daily active users, that there's been a 9% increase week over week in transactions, 195,000 new uh, users or addresses this week alone, and a new all-time high network revenues. And you know what's funny? I haven't heard about Polygon much on Twitter lately. You know, there was kind of like a whole Polygon summer that went on because they had liquidity mining and stuff like that. And everyone was bridging over to Polygon and it became like a big thing. Um, but now they have like a really self-sustained ecosystem that continues to grow, which I'm really loving and I really love seeing. And a bit of an alpha leak here, Mahalo actually replied to my tweet and said, um, you know, that we are just starting both in terms of adoption and solutions that we offer. And he goes, the POS chain in, is, is an immediate solution relief for the pressing need to scale Ethereum. We are now working hard on EVM compatible true layer twos and other advanced solutions. And this is what I've been saying for a while. I mean, as, I, as you guys know, I'm an advisor to Polygon and I've been saying it for a while that the POS chain is a temporary solution. It is not the end goal here. Polygon really want to be at the forefront of the uh, of the, uh, the the roll up revolution. And as I, as I've mentioned before, they've put a billion dollars to researching uh, different zk tech. They acquired Hermes, and you know after diving into Hermes's tech, it's amazing. Like the zk EVM that they're building is incredible. It's a fully EVM compatible zk roll up. 
It's going to be amazing. Like generalized ZK roll, uh, ZK roll up there. It's going to be absolutely amazing. But I mean, Polygon is more than just the POS chain, the roll or the roll ups. They have their data availability blockchain. Um, they have uh, the Nightfall stuff that they're doing. They have uh, uh, the SDK, all that sorts of stuff. I mean, lots of stuff happening here. And it's just amazing to see the continued growth on their POS chain as well. Uh, speaking of layer twos, Ryan Berkman's here put out a really great thread comparing StarkNet, which is StarkWare's generalized layer two, uh, ZK Rollup layer two versus Solana. So, I mean, I'm not going to read out this whole thread, but it's really great. Uh, definitely go check this out. It kind of like further cements my, I guess, like theory that I believe pretty much most other layer one blockchains are just going to end up being a roll up on Ethereum or they'll pivot to being a roll up centric kind of chain, which kind of defeats the purpose of having them because if they're scaling via layer two and becoming roll up centric, especially if they do sharding as well, then what's the point? Like just use Ethereum. Like I'm not trying to be a maximalist here, but there is literally no point to another chain just doing the same thing that Ethereum does. Um, and that's why a lot of them try to differentiate themselves because they know this. They know if they're just an Ethereum clone, then long-term that's not going to work. And we've already seen this play out. Like BSC, for example, I think their growth has kind of like stunted um, and, and slowed down and kind of like gone backwards because they're just an Ethereum clone. They're doing nothing innovative. There's nothing uh, special about it. And then there's a lot of these other chains right now that are only growing because they're like EVM compatible, uh, like the Avalanche C chain, for example. I know they're doing a bunch of other kind of stuff and I'm not trying to kind of like a crap on any project here, but they the C chain is an EVM compatible, sorry, that the, the, the particular C chain I'm talking about is the EVM compatible one. Again, that's just a clone of the EVM with, with cheaper fees. And I know, you know, Arbitrum and Optimism are, are just that right now. But the thing is, is that they're better than the separate chains because um, as I mentioned before, layer two is on Ethereum uh, 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 secured by a layer one. And as I explained the other day, Arbitrum sequencer went down, but that didn't mean anything. Like it doesn't matter if it sequences down, you can still get your funds back. Whereas Solana went down and you couldn't do anything for 20 hours. You couldn't access your funds, couldn't do any on-chain transactions. And you were at the mercy of a small group of people to get this chain back up and running. That's not what we want. That is not the future of this industry. So this thread does a really great job of breaking down why Rollups are just on a technical level, not even talking about decentralization, on a technical level, much better at scaling uh, blockchains than, uh, than than Solana is and Solana's tech. Because as I, as I mentioned before, Solana wants to do everything at layer one without sharding. That to me is impossible. Even if they totally centralize the system 100%, even if they just have one validator running the system or, or a handful doing load balancing um, or whatever, uh, uh, that's that's not it's not going to work. I, I don't believe it's going to work. I believe rollups are, are the future, and you've heard me talk about this a lot of times. So definitely check out this thread for a, for a deeper dive on that. Uh, Hop Protocol announced today that they now support Arbitrum. So you can now send USDC and USDC for Arbitrum to any Hop supported network, including Polygon, the Ethereum mainnet, and I think there's one more in there. And ETH is coming next week. So for those of you who may ask, you know, when's ETH support? Next week, which is really, really cool. So you know, I mentioned before how I think that you only really need ETH and stable coins. I don't think you need to have like a bridge for every token into these layer twos because you can basically do a thing where um, you can deposit the, the tokens in there um, or have these tokens on the layer twos and then you just bridge ETH in and swap for that token if you want it on layer two. You don't have to have a bridge for every conceivable token out there. So it's good that they're starting with stable coins and then going to ETH. I really like that, especially from a liquidity perspective as well. It makes a lot of sense. But yeah, this is a better way to get your funds in and out of Arbitrum because there is no seven day delay. That is the big draw, uh, the, the, the big kind of, I guess, like advantage of these kind of bridges is that uh, you get near instant transactions out of these rollups and you don't have to wait seven days. Uh, this is just, I guess, like uh, uh, pertains to optimistic rollups, but I think that was the largest drawback and it's already been solved. And as I said, you know, it's already been solved. All these problems are solved. We're just rolling out the solutions uh, as time goes on. So Uniswap uh, put out an update today that they have launched a feature called Auto Router in the Uniswap interface. So what this does is it delivers better execution prices for traders by splitting uh, uh, the routes using more data and factoring in gas costs. This is similar to, I guess, like what One Inch does and other DEX aggregators do. And you can see here kind of how it works. The standard router, uh, you can see that the price impact is like 20% in this example, whereas with the Auto Router, the price impact would only be 2%. So this is a pretty substantial, um, uh, substantial difference here. Here, which is which is really cool to see. I mean, as I said, this is exactly what one inch and other DEX aggregators do, but this is just Uniswap doing it in-house, which is which is quite amazing. So yeah, definitely go check out this three where they detail uh, kind of like under under the hood how it works some more. Uh, it's very interesting, and I'm I'm glad to see Uniswap keep you know keep doing I guess um 
more innovative stuff like this. They definitely, uh, you know, Unisop sometimes gets a lot of hate about certain things. And I don't know why, but they are one of the most innovative uh, teams and long-term oriented teams in the crypto ecosystem. So yeah, I mean, kudos to them for kind of working really hard on these sorts of things and delivering them at the end of the day and delivering them in a really, really great way. Um, I, I, I enjoy it whenever they, they kind of like release a new product here. All right, so Thales, I, I forgot to mention the other day that Thales, uh, their token is now live and anyone who was kind of like an SNX staker and I think there's a few other things um, in there that entitled you to an airdrop, uh, you have an airdrop to claim. So if you go to the Thales kind of like website and click on, I think there's like an airdrop uh, uh, kind of tab, you'll be able to see if you were an SNX staker or anything like that, you'll be able to see how much uh, Thales tokens you're entitled to. Some of them have vested over time. Some of them you can claim now and there's a, an active market for Thales, of course. Um, but this announcement here, you can see that there's actually a Thales ETH pool on uh, Breeder, uh, Breeder, on Dodo, um, which is now live, and you can get Thales token and Dodo rewards for for providing um, liquidity to this pool. So yeah, if you do get your airdrop tokens, maybe you want to provide them to the Thales ETH pool and and earn some more rewards on that. That's uh, that's I guess like uh, totally up to you. Um, for, and just for a quick recap here for people, Thales is a binary options market on Ethereum. Uh, they spun out of uh, the synthetics ecosystem to kind of like uh, go at it on their own, kind of similar to what Lyra and Quenta did as well. Um, but yeah, you can go check out. Uh, the airdrop page to see if you've got an airdrop and then maybe go uh, earn some extra Thales and Dodo rewards in this, uh, this pool here. All right, last thing to talk about was a, uh, a new raise from Forefront here, one that I participated in, disclosure there, but Forefront announced a $2.1 million raise via a community-driven treasury diversification round um, with participation from a bunch of different people here. So there was a bunch of funds that participated, such as 1KX and Scalar Capital, which led the round, and then participation from uh, Meta Cartel Ventures and a bunch of others, and then a bunch of angels, uh, including myself, participated in this. Now, for those of you who don't know what Forefront is, they are aiming to be the port of entry for social clubs and digital cities. That's what they describe themselves as. In plain, plain English, it basically means that they want to be kind of like a social token, social club, uh, I guess like um, a DAO Web3 curator at the end of the day, where you can go there, you can kind of, I guess, like uh, go, into their, go to their website, keep up to date with what's happening in the social kind of, I guess, token space in the Web3 DAO space or the, in the social club space, whatever. Uh, and I think I've been paying more attention to this, to this recently. I think this is actually going to be much bigger than people think. I used to be very bearish on social tokens, but I think social tokens attached to an individual is what I was bearish on. Social tokens that are attached to not just an individual, but like a group of people, especially the social clubs like Friends with Benefits, um, which I actually, uh, I bought like Friends with Benefits tokens a while ago and I still, still hold a, a large chunk of them. Um, those kind of like exclusive social clubs where you have to own the token to get in and then once you're in, you know, people come together and do all sorts of things. That's just scaling to the globe and making digital what we already have. Like there's plenty of social clubs that already exist. There's plenty of high profile and high class social clubs that require massive buy-ins uh, from, from their members as well for all types of things. So it's not anything new, but we're, we're bringing it to the digital space and and kind of like uh, bringing it to crypto, which I think is, is, the, is the new kind of like frontier there. So yeah, if you want to learn more about, I guess, Forefront, what they're doing and the raise, you can check out the blog post here or the announcement post here, which will be linked in the YouTube description. But I think that is it for today. So thank you everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give that video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Oh, not tomorrow, next week. Tomorrow if you're joining the AMA though, but on the refuel, I'll catch you next week. Thanks everyone.